I see all the younger guys in there, and they have, it's just not the same as when, I mean, I remember the days back in the 60s and 70s, the FAA would come and visit quite regularly, but they would really say, well, this is what's going on now, this is what we need to do. You know, they were really helping us stay in business. And now it's almost you're afraid of being, they come in and tell me a violation they can write upon you. Of course, I know some people working for the FAA right now have been told by the FAA not to write so many violations right now because they're so busy on backlogging. February 1962, my first flight. Uh, August of that year, I got my private license. The uh, one of the companies on the field had a beach uh, D model, and uh, he said, "Do you want to ride O'Hare with me?" So he, uh, I, got to go to O'Hare, ride in the right seat, and it was a D model with a nose tank, and uh, I didn't realize what he was doing, but he pulled both engines, pulling off the nose tank. And every 10 or 15 minutes, I had to retrim the airplane because <laughs> all that fuel coming out of the nose. <laughs> and he sits over there grinning at me. <laughs> he knew <laughs> what he did. But uh, I didn't get back to flying Twin Beach until after, I, I, after that I went to the military. I was a mechanic on aircraft military. Queen Airs is what we had. It was a general's airplane. I was really keeping the base commander happy. And uh, I. I kept the airplane going good and he was happy and he made sure nobody bothered with me. Uh, then uh, I got out and went back down south crop dusting for, I got my commercial while I was in, got crop going crop dusting. And after I realized a couple of years that I wasn't going to get rich crop dusting, and we were going to build up a bigger flying service, but the operator decided not to go any further. We agreed. I went back, said I'm going to take two weeks to visit my folks and two weeks looking for a job. I came back to Muskegon, went over to the local flight operations and visited everybody. He said, why don't you go to work for us? And I had my flight instructor then, my commercial. So uh, they had a VA flight school. I went in as a mechanic, but I gave all the phase checks and I gave, uh, uh, did a Quite a bit of flying. Was, there was a lot of flying going on back in the 60s compared to today in the local airport. And every time the Twin Beach went out, I got a chance to ride the right seat. And finally, he put me in the left seat for quite a few rides. And uh, one day he says, Next trip, take the Twin Beach. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, we were actually had it fixed up really good for people. We would take the seats out and throw boxes in there for freight when we had to. So whatever whatever they wanted to carry, we configured the airplane, might say. And uh, we ended up, took the airplane, uh, had a complete paint job, all new interior, really, really nice. But uh, then uh, we got into doing quite a bit of freight, and I did put a freight door on it. And uh, I was the Twin Beach pilot pretty much for the company. The owner flew it sometimes, but uh, whatever, most trips I took. And uh, I say uh, one trip I was taken freight up to uh, uh, Everett, uh, and we landed Reed City at night in Everett during the day. For uh, it was a, a plant up there that was working for American Motors. And. We, we picked up St. Elbow's Fire to where the whole aircraft just lit up. I mean, the windshield was all arcing. You could see the arc of the props, and you could see fire shooting off the wingtips. And one of the boys riding with me had just got his instructor rating and stuff, and I just glanced over at him, and he's staring at me, and I'm just, mm -hmm, just fly. <laughs> I knew, I figured when I got closer that the VOR would override the static, and, it did when we got there. We we didn't didn't have no problem with it. So so for people that don't really understand what St. Elmo's fire actually is, explain what that that phenomenon is. It's a static to actually arc, just like you can take your nylons and you can uh, run together and you can get a, uh, a actually a spark. You can see it well in the air. Uh, when I was flying one of the other airplanes, I could hear a snapping every now and then. When I finally at night, I realized it was arcing up to the little temperature probe we had out there from the, uh, the airplane. 
the windows are all plastic and they're very susceptible to static electricity. Uh, actually, on most of the larger airplanes, you'll see a ground strap between the ailerons and the wing because they've had the static electricity set up through the wing and actually weld the aileron hinge. So they bond them together, real, all the control surfaces, so that there's no, no place for a dark across the hinges. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Well, uh, what, was, what was one of your toughest, um, toughest flights uh, in the beach, one of the most challenging ones, would you say? Well, I, I came in one night to Everett, and I had been over to Canada picking up some stuff for the plant. I stopped in Port Huron, and it was an awful windy. And uh, after I cleared customs, headed back to Everett, I said, I'm not going to fight the wind at Everett. I'm going to use their solid runway, an 18-foot solid runway, 1,800 feet. And I didn't even fly over and check the wind. I just planned to enter and come into it, and it was all ready. And I touched down, I looked over at the wind sock, and I was laying limp. And I really didn't have enough runway to get stopped. So I reached down, unlocked the tailwheel, come in with the throttles, and the airplane swung right around 180 degrees, and I had full power on it and stopped my... <laughs> and uh, I know from doing that one other time that if when you start, you got to go. If you decide to chicken out, you're going to ball the airplane up. <laughs> so and you came in tail first? Well, I, I ended up tail first in full power to stop my <laughs> movement going the other direction. <laughs> and uh, I, I, another trip I had, I took a broken back patient to uh, Portland, Oregon. And uh, they wanted me to pick him up in small airport spire just north of Grand Rapids. Well, I decided that's, I didn't want to fill the tanks up to come out of there. And I flew over there, and when I got there, they were, up, they were below minimums. I couldn't get in. So I went to the larger airport, Grand Rapids, and you're going to have to bring it up there. And so I filled all the tanks up. I get a call from the operator at the airport. says, he's up flying to 150 right now. we got 1,200 feet here. <laughs> so I jumped in the airplane, flew in there, and was able to make the landing. When I landed, it started pouring down rain. And it poured rain for about, I mean, really heavy rain for about an hour. and we. They brought the ambulance out there with the patient. We got the, him in there in a striker bed, and I was taking the, his sister, a nurse, and a co-pilot with me. And we waited until finally, ah, yeah, we got a mild visibility. <laughs> and I got everybody in the airplane. I got the end runway. The operator called, got my void clearance so I could take off. I took off and uh, was right into the, the soup. Middle of Lake Michigan, broke out in the clear. Just a beautiful weather. We went on to uh, North Dakota. We took the northern route because there was weather in the south. Went from there to uh, Billings, Montana. And that was my first experience with really, a 6,000 foot uh, elevation there. Uh, not power of the beach, but it was interesting. I could tell the difference with the high altitude. And, the, and we uh, refueled there. Now, I'd filed a medical flight, but never heard anything. And from North Dakota to uh, Billings, I went over the Badlands, and I didn't realize the first time I ever did that. They are bad out there. If you ever go down out there, I don't think they're gonna, there's, nobody, there's no roads, there's no way to get through you. It's quite, quite. But uh, I left Billings, and I took a little northern route, which I could stay below uh, 8,000 feet most of the time, because I didn't want to get the patient in a non-pressurized airplane up there. And we got in the rain, and Senator started calling me every five minutes. <laughs> How's your ride? How's your ride? And it stayed with me. And when I landed at Portland, it was pouring down rain, and I touched the Twin Beasts down, and I was hydroplaning. I, I had 200 feet wide and 10,000 feet long, so it was really no problem, but I, I could feel I was just riding on the water until finally I slowed down and <laughs> sat down in. The, Patient, uh, he said, uh, see, I told you Portland is just like Michigan. There's no difference in the weather. <laughs> so. That's a good story. Mm -hmm. That's a good story. 
So what is it about the, the Twin Beach that's so appealing, do you think? It's one of the most stable airplanes in the air. Uh, it does take some maintenance, but I was a mechanic and I, when I wasn't flying it, I was fixing something on it and uh, we didn't waste any money, had quite a few engines. We did have one trip, everything went wrong. Our radios were the old expensive radios that sometimes they give you trouble. And uh, we uh, couldn't channel anything but one channel. We did get it going. But we took off and we had, uh, it was so cold that day. And when you shut them down cold, you want to dilute them. You got to wait until they cool down and everything. Well, we, we had trouble. We uh, When we went to start it, uh, we lost a generator. Uh, we used it to help for them start. We got it started, lost that generator, and the propeller wasn't going in at high pitch, or flat pitch, high RPM. So on takeoff, being the conversion we had, we were able to use a boost pump to keep the propeller in high pitch. Got airborne, it was okay. We turned around and we uh, had to go to Wausau, drop off for some people again. We didn't shut down the engines, but we had to use the boost pump quite a bit to keep the propeller in a low pitch. And uh, so we, when we got back to Muskegon, we're attaching in. I mean, the propeller one of the feathers were attaching in. And we let it out. We went and told the boss. We said, well, we lost the generator, we lost the radio, and we lost the, uh, he says, how much do the passengers know? He says, they don't know anything. He says, you didn't have a problem. That's pretty good, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what do you, I mean, what, in your days as a freight dog, uh, what what do you remember most about it, what it meant to have that as an occupation? Well, uh, a lot of times, I mean, I, I would be in the mechanic, I'd be working the shop all day, and then they'd say, oh, we, gotta get these, we had to get these rings to Dallas, Texas that night. So I would load it up and it was only a few hundred pounds. Go to stop St. Louis refuel, go on to Dallas. I'd get there about two o'clock in the morning. Call General Motors. What you got? We got your pistons for tomorrow morning production. Uh, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> so I'd say your pistons, your rings are here. I'm going to bed. <laughs> Told the freight. freight yeah, I get a signature when they pick up the freight in the morning before it was gone. <laughs> So it's kind of a work. It was kind of really a work ethic with you. I mean, you just yeah. sort of did what needed to be done. Don't don't you think that's kind of it? Yeah. Uh, one night, uh, somebody had messed up on a shipment. It was going overseas, and we had to get uh, a few thousand pounds over to Milwaukee at Timberman Field to get for the overseas shipment. And well, so I had to take uh, three different trips to get it all over there, and just from Muskegon to Milwaukee is 45 minute run. And I pulled up in Timberland one time, I turned around and when I shut it down, uh, the engine shake a little bit, one of the exhaust pipe broke off and fell on the ground. And the ramp guy, hey, you know, he pointed out to it. And I don't know, I looked at it, look at it. Yeah, that's not bad, picked up, threw it in the back. I flew back to Muskegon, took the parts off, walled it up, Pull it back on and flew back to Timberman a couple hours later. <laughs> so you were lucky you were a mechanic too. I mean, really. I mean, yeah. You should be able to do stuff like that. Oh, yes, yeah. It, I mean, that it came made, in real handy. That came in real handy when you get a. I have seen pilots when I run the airport. I mean, the engines were running very bad. And he'd be running up and he'd be smoke piling out. And halfway down the runway, it would finally clear up. <laughs> and then away they would go. That just sounds like fl literally flying by the seat of your pants, kind of. Yes, yes. Uh, what I found uh, I, I enjoyed because I had adjustments for oil temperature, I had adjustments for uh, cylinder head temperature, I had adjustments for bypasses, I had all kinds of controls, and my hand was always tweaking something to keep the gauges in the green where I wanted to go. And it was an ice maker, so you had to have carburetor heat, we had to keep that gauge in the green too and everything. And the uh, uh, company proceeded to get a uh, Navajo, pressurized Navajo, and I had to start flying it. Uh, what do I do with my right hand? 
all automatic health compensators for the health of the tooth and everything else, you know, <laughs> that's anything. You were so used to the beach, you didn't kind of know what to do with the news. The right, I mean, yeah. Wow. I learned now. I, I did have one dang, one horrible flight. Uh, I took a, We took a bunch of people to Elk Hill, Wisconsin to look at some new silos. The company was paying for them, stayed the night. I had to take them back to Grand Rapids. There was actually me and a Martin 404. We were taking all these people. And uh, I got my clearance back to Grand Rapids and uh, I checked the weather. The only thing that was a legal alternate was El Claire, so I had to fill full fuel. <clears throat> and uh, they called me, uh, like, we got your clearance, but maybe you don't want it, he said. They got freezing and rain in Grand Rapids right now. And I said, hmm, freezing rain? There's got to be some warm air above there, so I'm only, you know, I, I can land on the ice. I'm not worried about that. So I'll take the clearance. And I figured I could always go north to Traverse City. It was colder. I said, we would have the icing problem if I, if I had to. Well, I took on the trip back, and when I got to Lake Michigan, center star said, how's the ice? And I didn't have any problem. Everything was fine. <laughs> I hit the lake shore on the Michigan side, and ice started picking up. And we had alcohol props and alcohol windshield. The windshield was solid ice. That, that was ridiculous. But that wasn't my main concern. The props, you, you got to reestate to adjust the flow. And if you go all the way up, you got about 30 minutes of alcohol. And I knew I needed more than that. So you, you always adjust the alcohol. You're hearing the ice hitting the fuselage. To, you can stand the noise on the ice. You know, you're trying to judge what's best. And everybody's trying to get into Grand Rapids. So they brought me in at 7,000 feet in a hold. And so I'm in my hold doing, and that was the days they didn't have radar, so they weren't watch, they didn't know where you were. <laughs> you had to report your position. And so I'm in a hold at 7,000 feet. They clear me down to six, and they clear me down to five finally. Everybody's finally going in. And all of a sudden, uh, I'm making my turn and the airplane stalls out. I got full power. I'm main, I can maintain 140 miles an hour. Anything over a 10 degree bank, I'd stall out. So finally, I started losing too much altitude. I shut the autopilot off, went manual flying it. I finally declared an emergency. And there was one more airplane, one on approach, and one below me. And the guy was a 310 down below me. He said, But I'm getting nice too. They said, The guy above you declared an emergency. You have your choice. So either you either had to declare an emergency or go to the be a while as they, they cleared them out of there. So uh, they asked me at that time what my position was and I said my walk intersection. It was the back course approach and off the VOR. And uh, finally they said okay cleared for the approach. Well, I was uh, a thousand feet too high to start the approach and I thought it was my choice to what to do. So I'm going to go one more turn in the hole to lose my altitude and get position down. And uh, I stalled her out two or three more times and kept negotiating. Finally, I said, I'll get back to the localizer so I know somewhere where I am. By that time, I was going below the initial start altitude. I got back to the localizer, and uh, I was inside the localizer, so I ended up with an outbound heading. And just about the time I needled them, they said, what's your position? I said, my walker intersection. So I was had to go back and I knew I only had to make a short turn to get back, head back inbound. So I'm doing that and I, I started breaking in and out of the clouds a little bit then. I didn't think I was going to make the airport, but I figured I'd just keep flying until I knew what I had to when I, when I finally broke loose. And uh, I got turned around, I finally got her turned around, I got back headed on the localizer and Neil centered again and they said, what's your position? I'm, I'm at Walker Intersection. <laughs> so I get Walker Intersection for 15 minutes. This time I was headed inbound. They said, we got a report of a little flying aircraft out over South Kent. And I, I, knew, I knew they were talking about me, but I didn't have a chance to let go of anything to talk to anybody. And uh, so on the way in, I started to get some warm air and I did lose the ice on the windshield. And I finally got the field in sight. I, I'll put down the gear, see what happens. Got down the gear, everything was green, it was stable. So I. Put a few, and they asked me at that time, do, do you want the emergency equipment out? I said, might as well have it out. I don't know what's going to happen when I get in there. And they uh, had the emergency equipment waiting for me. And when I 
tried to flap, so everything went good. We made a nice, perfect landing. Taxied up the ramp. All my passengers got out, kissed the ground. <laughs> and the fellow uh, who was in my right seat, he says, you just kept flying the airplane. <laughs> well, that's what I had to do. I mean, that's the only thing there was. If I hadn't quite cut on the airplane, we never would have made it. He was real helpful. He was not a pilot, but he did kind of people down. You know, they, what's going on up there? And we're talking to emergency. Get your seats. You know, get your seat belts on. He was, he was really a help in that respect because I didn't have time to do anything with the passengers. <laughs> wow, that's a great story. Yeah, that's just wow. That's that's a real white knuckle one. Ooh. I I. At that time, the FAA was real good to me. I, why I say real good, that's when we used to talk to each other. Uh, the tower told me because of the break in the uh, altitude, and uh, uh, they had to write a report on what they did, and I had to write a report on what I did. So I sat down in the motel that night, and I'm writing a detailed story. And uh, three or four days later, my boss calls me in. He said, you got to call Maruti at the office. He said, the way you wrote your report, it could be incriminating. So we suggest you write another one. So, I mean, I got weather reports and I had all my training data and I had all my motel receipts, my work t duty time and everything else and gave them a pack of papers like this. It didn't, didn't mean a lot, but they were happy and that nothing was ever said. <laughs> to verify what all happened. Yeah. So that that you wouldn't get in any kind right. of trouble, or more importantly, the company wouldn't either. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I knew from flying ice from the, that normally you have a thousand foot of ice heavy, and above it or below it, it's either colder or warmer. Uh, in but it turned out this night they said a uh, uh, a air commander had went into Kalamazoo and one another airplane went into Kalansing, and they picked up ice all the way down. It was a stable. Uh, area of ice and uh, un unusual, but uh, there's two other airplanes, other airports right nearby, all, all been through that same phenomenon. That's a good story. Great That's story. a good story. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you want to add yeah. about the beach or your days? Of I thought it was fu funny. Well, I quit the company and went to another job, and they hired this old pilot back. And uh, the next trip, he flew over to freight over to Milwaukee. On the way back, he looks out the right engine, and all she sees is fire. He shut down the engine, the fire went off, and it, it blew a cylinder. It blew the, uh, and uh, blew it right at the top of the cylinder. When it does, you're pumping the fuel to it, and the fire is burning out there, you know. <laughs> you don't even know it with that rail engine. If you lose the cylinder, it's uh, just a little bit rougher, but it's <laughs> He needed, he needed a little more experience at the sound of Oh, he, no, he's seen the fire. He just shut it down and oh, yeah. come in on one yeah. engine and have no problem. But uh, oh, the very same trip right after I quit the company, he came in. Yeah.